Hi, today I'd like to tell you about some of my favourite landform and sediment associations in the Australian drylands. My name is Grizzly Wakeland King and I'm an arid zone geomorphologist. We'll uh, talk about the context of the drylands both globally and in terms of Australia and then I'd like to tell you four stories about um, uh, processes that make these interesting places come to be. The drylands are widespread in, and important. Globally, they constitute 40% of the world's land mass and host 30% of the world's population. The main Australian continent is 80% drylands. Although thinly populated, this holds um, a number of towns and indigenous homelands and supports many industries and businesses. Sediments deposited in the drylands are also present throughout the rock record. The thing that characterises drylands obviously is a moisture deficit and this has several important um, important consequences. Firstly, drylands rivers have extremely variable flow regimes. So this is an example hydrograph. Uh, on the left is a typical drylands river situation where flow is usually uh, low or non-existent, dry, but flooding is a regular and expected part of the drylands flow regime. Whereas temperate zone rivers tend to be low variability and the flooding, although it does happen, is neither uh, is, is not usually so big. Drylands have low soil and vegetation cover in many places, such as here in the Gibber Plain of the Neils catchment on the west side of the Lake Eyre Basin. So when rain does fall, you can get quite rapid rain runoff and that has important consequences for how the rivers behave. The plant life strategies um, cling to water retaining landforms. So this is the macro channel of the Niels River and you can see it's full of trees and this is a fairly common situation. This has important consequences for things like sediment deposition patterns, bioengineering and the distribution of er erosion across a river system. Finally, because of the episodic nature of the flow and the often small volume of the flow events, drylands rivers tend to be transport limited in their sediment routing. Here's an example um, in Cooper Creek. The sands that have come out of this channel have not gotten very much further than the various distributary arms of the channel terminus. Now it's an interesting thing that Australian drylands are not very much like Northern Hemisphere drylands. This is important because many of the classic desert studies were done in the Northern Hemisphere places like Death Valley shown in the picture here. In these classic studies, the catchments are small and have steep gradients. The rock that is supplied is fresh and coarse into the, uh, into the fluvial transport and the flow regime is short flashy flows. Australia, on the other hand, has a widespread and deep regolith cover, so lots of fine sediments and clays ready to enter fluvial transport. The continent is largely very low relief and has some quite large catchments in it. That means that there can be um, flow events that are very sustained and also very big floods. The first of the stories I'd like to tell you is about mud aggregate sediments. Now in the present day, mud aggregate sediments, which derive from vertic soils or vertisols, you might also know them as cracking clay soils or black soils, are very irregularly distributed around the globe. Australia has more than our fair share and then there's other areas of vertex sediments in India, Ethiopia and the Sudan and bits of the Americas. However, mud aggregate sediments are likely to be the precursor of massive mud rock. So what this means is that there is a, um, there's, a there's an important lithotype in the rock record 
which doesn't have very many um, studied modern analogues. And in fact, the only two places where there's been sedimentological and geomorphological studies of mud aggregate rivers are both here in Australia, Cooper Creek and Fowler's Creek. The landscapes that these mud aggregates form are Gilgai, so bumpy and heaved with big cracks and macropores. You can get black vertic soils like this. This is one of the lagoons in the Diamantina River and red vertic soils. This is Stony Gilgai in the west of New South Wales. The way the mud aggregates work as sediments is that they are dry and hard when they're when they're dry lumps, but the merest touch of water on them and they collapse into sand sized particles. These sand sized particles, although they consist entirely of clay and, um, and silt, are quite robust and will survive long distances of fluvial transport. And when they're deposited, they're deposited as bed load, such as this entirely mud bunch of current ripples from Fowler's Creek. Early diagenesis means that the, um, the mud aggregate sediments lose most of their depositional structure or all of their depositional structure very soon after deposition. Because the soils shrink and swell during normal weather, that, that kind of wrecks the layering. So in a very short space of time, the deposited muds become massive or there may be uh, coarse layering preserved, but it has very uh, indefinite um, layer boundaries. If you get coarse clasts or thin sandy layers, deposited with the mud aggregates. After the depositional layering has been destroyed, these coarser things will seem to float in the mud without apparent context. The next story is low angle alluvial fans. These are very important in the Australian landscape. They're not at all well researched, but they're very, very common. They're really big, so tens to hundreds of kilometres in extent very flat with downstream diverging drainage. The first example we're going to look at is in the Victorian Riverine Plains, work currently being done by Karen Captainus. In the digital eleva elevation model, you can see the fan structure as it comes out of the hills. Looking at the measured topography, it's very low relief and low gradient. Look, out, look at the vertical exaggeration that has to be used in these diagrams to see anything at all. 7,400 times vertical exaggeration on that cross profile. As a landscape, the, um, the Victorian fans are silt and mud, mud aggregate sediments in a wide plain with very small sinuous distributaries. When it rains a lot, they, f they overbank very quickly and so uh, the flows are distributed, as you see here in this MODIS satellite photo of a recent flood event. The flows are distributed as sheet flow across the landscape. So it's likely that the sediments are being deposited uh, as vertical accretion from the sheet flow. This is a work in progress, so we don't know yet what it's going to look like as uh, in the rock record, but I suggest that it's going to be massive mud rock or possibly thin white, wide thin sheets if the layering's preserved, which it may not be. In contrast, the Cooper Creek fan, which is this whole thing, it's prograding from the Inaminka Dome uplands out into the Strislecki Plain. It's a mixed landscape of alluvial and aeolian landforms. So there are big creeks with levees and in between the creeks are compound dunes and the alluvial and aeolian landforms have co-created each other through a long and complex landscape history. In the present day, the sediments from the river, which are this pale sandy stuff, is being deposited by overbanks and by distributaries into the interdune space between these orange compound dunes. 
and the alluvial sediments are prograding over an older muddy alluvial plain. So what this is going to look like in the rock record is a complex diachronous stratigraphy with interfingering sands of different age and character, disconformable over some kind of patchy mud rock. The third story is about flood outs. These are a fluvial feature they occur on a scale of uh, tens of kilometres or less usually. And the way a flood out appears in the landscape is, um, is uh, you'll see a river uh, as it flows downstream and there will come a point where the channel starts to lose its definition. Often it becomes a little bit distributary and then the channel will disappear. The flow path continues, but it's completely unchanneled flow there's no um, there's vegetation to show you where the flow path is but no channel 100% floodplain so the flow continues down across the flood out as shallow low energy sheet flow as in this picture here from a flow event that happened in Texas um, the you can see from the tree trunks that the flow is very shallow and in the foreground, it's being captured by a modern day uh, gully system head cut. The landforms um, in the proximal part of the flood out where the valley is starting to wide, widen outwards and the rivers start to become lower energy and as they become less confined, Typically, the channel becomes more wide and shallow and often becomes anabranching or wandering or in some other way changes its planned form. The distal part of the flood out is mostly, uh, mostly visible by the dense veg vegetation in the flow path. There's no channels, although there may be a couple of small local gutters. It's been proposed that flood outs will have a sedimentary deposits that will be um, formed on top of channel deposits from a previous iteration of the stream. And then there'll be coarse proximal flood out deposits, sands from the channel termination or interbedded sand sheets and muds. And then it will fine both laterally and down, down flow. Um, and that the distal flood out deposits will be, you know, muds or fines of some sort. Here's an example from Fowler's Creek. This is near the proximal part of a flood out and you'll see there are uh, planar bedded coarse, um, pebbly coarse sands and uh, interbedded with muds. The final story is about planar bedding. So this is, this is a story that takes place at bed form scale, or if we're thinking about the rock record, this is at hand specimen scale or core scale. If you look at a bed form stability diagram, you'd be forgiven for thinking that there's not a lot of likelihood of finding planar bedded sediments um, in fluvial systems. So in in sediments of you know, medium to coarse sand, um, the conditions for lower flow regime planar bedding are quite specific. It's quite a narrow bed form stability range and you don't seem to get upper flow regime um, planar bedding. In the finer sediments, the coarse silts and fine to medium sands, you get upper planar bedding in this sort of uh, range here around, um, around the transition between lower flow regime and, and upper flow regime, so a frowd number of about one. Um, but you don't seem to get lower flow regime planar bedding. So what tends to happen in the rock record is that people who see flat bedded fine sandstones or flat bedded sands tend to say, okay, this has got to be upper flow regime planar bedding. 
that means it's got to be high energy and then they um, then they usually tie that to a story about um, flood pulses or the peak of flooding events. But in fact, what happens in the landscape is that flat bedding is absolutely widespread and there's no way that all this can be deposited from upper flow regime flows, you know, as if frozen in mid transport like this. Um, at least not upper flow regime in terms of a, a big flood pulse, you know, deep water and the peak of the flow event. That's not what we're seeing here. There is a very, very big literature around this, but I just want to point out a couple of things that promote planar bedding. When you have a flow that is shallowing rapidly, so in a flashy flow event at the recession limb of the flooding, when, you're, when, you're, uh, when your flood is draining away and the depth decreases, the rapid shallowing can cause a return to upper flow regime conditions. So looking at this graph of flow depth versus food number, you can see that as the flow depth falls, this flow, which is consistently subcritical, all of a sudden at the shallowest last gasp becomes supercritical. So you can get upper flow regime conditions just at the very last gasp of shallowing. The other thing that can happen is that as, um, as a flow suddenly loses energy, so for example, if a flow becomes wide and shallow all of a sudden, it will lose competence, obviously, and its sediments will drop out. And what you might get then is a hyper-concentrated layer at the bottom of the water column where the sediment deposition is taking place. So um, flume studies have shown that you can get upper flow regime planar bedding and fine sediments even under flow conditions that um, the rest of the flow is experiencing lower flow regime, fully turbulent uh, flow. So in summary, Australian dryland sedimentary systems are rich in information about important but under-researched depositional environments. And my summary example here is a bank section from Fowler's Creek in New South Wales. This is a bank section through a flood out deposit. Down at the base here, we have old cross bedded channel sands from a previous iteration of the stream. Then we have most the uh, the channel terminus gravelly outwash still planar bedded. You can see with low energy cluster bed forms in there. Then the proximal to mid flood out interbedded muds and gravelly sands in flat bedding. Then the bulk of the deposit is the old uh, distal flood out muds. It's been consolidated long enough that it's lost its uh, depositional structure. So it's just a massive big old bunch of mud there. And then um, finally, the modern floodplain sediments up the top, which are modern enough that you can see they're still retaining some of their depositional flat bedding. Image credits. And here's some citations if you want to chase up any of, de any of the details. Thanks very much for listening to my talk.